Unless you have looked at a world of snow, as Edmund had been looking at it, you will hardly be able to imagine what a relief those green patches were after the endless white. So writes C.S. Lewis in his classic children's novel, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This beautiful passage coming at a moment in the narrative when whispers of Aslan's return have begun to permeate Narnia. This beautiful passage presages the full restoration of Narnia that is eventually to come. For as long as anyone can remember, Narnia has been under the spell of the White Witch. For as long as anyone can remember, Narnia has been cloaked in snow and in darkness. For as long as anyone can remember, color has been absent and life has been suppressed. But now in this passage, suddenly signs of color and signs of life are popping up here and there, suggesting that something new is happening in Narnia, that something radical is breaking through, that change is on the way. Listen to more of Lewis's narration that follows, and I quote, As Edmund looked at a tree beside him, he saw a great load of snow suddenly slide off of it. And for the first time since he had entered Narnia, he saw the dark green of a fir tree. Soon there were more wonderful things. Coming suddenly around a corner, he saw the ground covered in every direction with little yellow crocuses. Then only five minutes later, he noticed a dozen crocuses growing around the foot of an old tree. And on and on, Lewis writes, describing how signs of life, how signs of the coming restoration of Narnia were now in this moment popping up here and there, pointing the way. Now, I could go on for hours about C.S. Lewis and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It is the book that as a child made me fall in love with reading. But I'll spare you that this morning. The only reason I bring the story up this morning is because it, perhaps better than any other illustration I know of, helps us understand what's happening in our gospel lesson today, and thus what's happening in this Advent season in which we are right now taking part. In today's text from Matthew's gospel, John the Baptist, he who first proclaimed Jesus as Messiah and he who baptized Jesus in the Jordan. Now by this point in Matthew's gospel, John is in prison. And as today's passage picks up, John sends a few of his disciples to ask Jesus whether he really is the one to come. Whether Jesus really is the one that all of Israel has been waiting for. Verse 2 says, and I quote, John sent word by his disciples to say to Jesus, Are you the one who is to come? Or are we to wait for another? This is a fascinating verse. It's a fascinating question. Had we not read the first part of Matthew's gospel, read about how John was certain of Jesus' identity when first he baptized him, had we not read that, then there would be nothing fascinating about this verse. But seeing as we have read the story of Jesus' baptism, and, and therefore seeing as we have known of John's former certainty, this verse thus becomes quite remarkable indeed. For why would John have been so convinced of Jesus' identity as the Messiah in chapter 3, but now in chapter 11, and chronologically speaking, a few years later, now, after all that prior certainty, suddenly be inquiring as to whether Jesus really is the Messiah after all? Do you follow that question? What has Jesus done that has caused John the Baptist to begin second-guessing him. 
Well, the answer is, it's what Jesus hasn't done that has caused John the Baptist to start second-guessing him. Follow me here. The Jews of Jesus' day had a very particular expectation for who their Messiah would be and what their Messiah would be like. The expectation was that the Messiah, whenever he finally came along, would be a charismatic figure, skilled in public leadership, capable of leading a revolt to free Israel from its subjectivity to Rome. And this, it ought to be noted, is what the majority of those who were following Jesus thought he was up to, what they were expecting from him. And so now, two years after he's baptized him, himself now in prison and sentenced to death, now John the Baptist, seeing no evidence of a revolution soon to take place, seeing no indication of Israel slipping out from under Rome's thumb, seeing no signs of the kingdom the Messiah was expected to bring about, seeing himself about to be executed, now, in light of all of this, John the Baptist quite reasonably begins to question, was this really the guy after all? Was this really the Messiah after all? Have I been wrong about all of this after all? So off go John's disciples to Jesus, and presently they deliver John's message. Are you the one who is to come? They ask. Or are we to wait for another? To which Jesus says, Go and tell John what you see and hear. Go and tell John what you see and hear. Because he knows what John is really asking. And because he knows that John's disciples don't see and hear that which Jesus is really referring to with this statement, he therefore now spells it out to them. Tell John what you see and hear, he says. Tell John how the blind receive their sight. How the lame walk. How the lepers are cleansed. How the deaf hear. How the dead are raised. How the poor receive good news. Go, Jesus says, and tell John that. Tell John that. Let me ask you a question. Why that? That's not what John or his disciples or anyone else for that matter is looking for. They're looking for signs of power and leadership and domination. So why does Jesus tell John's disciples to tell them about this stuff instead? Well, to help answer that question, let me now read you words from Isaiah chapter 35. Words from the 8th century BCE regarding the state of affairs that Jews of Jesus' day believed would come about in the coming kingdom of God, and I quote here, strengthen the weak hands, Isaiah prophesies, and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear, here is your God. And then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like deer, and then the tongue of the speechless shall sing for joy. These are words from the most celebrated prophet, the most widely read and quoted, most widely discussed and studied prophet of Jesus' day. These, in other words, were familiar words. These were words that people knew. Thus, Jesus, when asked whether he really is the Messiah, really is the one on whom they've been waiting, he says, hey, look closely at what I'm doing. Look at what is happening around me. Weak hands are being strengthened and feeble knees made firm. 
The eyes of the blind are being opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame are leaping like deer and the tongues of the speechless are singing for joy. In other words, look around you, he's saying. Look closely. Everything the prophets have said about the coming kingdom is slowly beginning to take place. Here and there, in certain places, the deaf are hearing and the lame are talking, he's pointing out. Here and there, in certain places, the blind are seeing and the lepers are being raised. Here and there, in certain places, the kingdom of God is already coming about. You're too busy looking for what you want to see from the Messiah, Jesus is saying. That you're failing to see the signs of God's kingdom already taking place. Leading me back now to the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. In that beautiful passage I quoted earlier, what the character Edmund was seeing was not the full-on restoration of Narnia, but was instead merely small signs of its full-on restoration to come. Do you follow that? He didn't see a forest filled with evergreen trees. Instead, he saw a forest filled with snow-covered trees, only one of which had green fur beginning to poke through. And he didn't see a field full of crocuses, Instead, he saw a small patch of crocuses popping up out of the frozen tundra all around him. In other words, what Lewis is depicting here is not the culmination, but is instead the beginning. What Lewis is depicting here is not the final state of things for Narnia, but is the first sign that a new state of things is one day coming. And follow me here now because here is the entirety of my sermon. So too is what Jesus is doing in the Gospels, not the culmination, but the beginning. So too is what Jesus is doing, not the final state of things, but the first sign that a new state is one day coming. The things Jesus tells John's disciples to report back to him on the lame walking, the blind seeing, the leper cleansed, the poor comforted. These are sprouts of green fur amid a forest of frozen trees. These are a patch of crocuses sprouting up out of a snow-covered field. They point to the restoration that we trust is one day to come, but they are not of themselves the restoration that is one day to come. For that they must wait. Just as James tells his church in our epistle lesson from today that they must wait, just as we today in this season of Advent must ourselves wait. The restoration we Christians believe is one day coming. That is what Advent is. It is a season of expectant waiting for that grand glorious day of restoration. And what's more, we as Christians, while we wait, believe we know a bit about what that restoration will one day look like. Because we've seen small signs of it through the life of Jesus. Because we've seen green furs popping out here and there. Because of that, we know what a forest full of pines will one day look like. Because we've seen lepers cleansed and the poor comforted, we therefore know what a kingdom where all are loved and made whole and are comforted and are embraced. We know because of that what that will look like. And what's more even than that, we as Christians, while we wait, believe we've been empowered by Christ himself to make manifest signs of that restoration too. 
empowered by Christ himself to, like him, clear a few trees and plant a few crocuses here in our own backyards. In other words, we as Christians believe we have been empowered by Christ to help cleanse the leper and help steady the feeble and help feed the hungry and help comfort the poor. On this day, let us do those things. On this day, let us heed James's call and wait patiently on the coming of the Lord. On this day, let us heed James's call to, like the farmer, plant our seeds and appreciate the few crocuses that our seeds yield forth. On this day, let us live in such a manner that our lives bring peace to a broken world. Yes, on this day, let us live in such a manner that when others ask whether the Spirit of God is alive and at work at Boulevard Baptist Church, we can truly respond just as Jesus did and simply say, go and tell what you see and hear.